My name is Luann Good Gingrich. I'm the director of the Global Labor Research Center or the GLRC at York University in Toronto. Welcome to this second webinar in our series. The series is entitled Contested Reproduction of States and Societies in Financialized Capitalism, Comparative Views from Turkey. I'll say just a little bit about the background of this series. In June of this year, the GLRC and the Department of Politics at York University hosted a workshop entitled Contested Reproduction of Turkey's Financialized Capitalism, State and Society in Crisis. The workshop brought together critical scholars of political economy working on the case of Turkey and the recent authoritarian drive in the country. The papers problematized the con constitutive role of financialization in author authoritarian state transformation. Um, did something happen? Are we still okay? Sorry about that. Um, the papers also considered state policies that weaken the power of labor in relation to capital, the enhancement of the coercive capacity of state and capital for social control. Besides identifying the Turkey specific determinants and consequences of, author of authoritarianism, the June workshop situated the Turkish experience within its global context. In this fall workshop series, we pick up that discussion and adopt a comparative focus to interrogate how transformative political pressures faced by the Turkish state and other countries are both the product of and the driving force behind current configurations of global capitalism. To this end, we're hosting Turkish scholars working on the Turkish case or other countries with a view from Turkey to compare and contrast the social, political and economic conditions leading to authoritarian state formations in selected country case examples. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Ali Riza Gunkin, currently a visiting professor at the Department of Politics and the GLRC at York University, who will introduce and chair our discussion for today, which is entitled Financialization, Labor and the State, Turkey, Poland and the US Compared. Ali Riza. Thank you, Luan. It's my pleasure to introduce Özgür Orhan Gazi and Ümit Akçay. Uh, in my research on financialization, I benefited a lot from the works of Professor Orhan Gazi. I have collaborated with Dr. Akçay in a few academic studies and have the opportunity to discuss with him the political economic developments in Turkey and emerging markets. Their works are sources of inspiration. Uh, Özgür Orhan Gazi is Professor of Economics at Kadir Has University, Istanbul. He received his PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He taught at Roosevelt University in Chicago and was an invited researcher at the Central Bank of Venezuela. He was a visiting scholar at the Political Economy Research Institute in Amherst and a visiting professor at University of Paris 13. So he's the author of Financialization and the US Economy, one of the most influential books in the field. He published extensively on financial and economic crises and uh, alternative economic policies. Uh, his current research focuses on concentration and monopolization in the US economy and financial fragility and crisis in Turkey and other developing economies. Um, Ümit Akçay is associate professor of economics and has been a visiting scholar at Berlin School of Economics and Law since 2017. Uh, he received his PhD in development economics from Marmara University, Turkey. He previously held teaching positions at Istanbul Bilgi University, Atulum University and Middle East Technical University in Turkey. Uh, and he was a scholar at the Department of Politics and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies in New York University. And he was also a scholar at the Department of Economics at Ordu University in Turkey between 20, uh, 2009 and 2011. Uh, he published several articles on financialization in Turkey and his current research focuses on neoliberal populism and financialization in emerging capitalist countries. So um, each speaker will have roughly 15 minutes to present their work. Then we'll have um, We'll have a round um, and I will ask them to reflect 
uh, and respond to each other's study. They will have another five minutes to, in a way, respond on each other's study. Then we'll have, uh, we'll move to Q&A session and hopefully we'll have like uh, 40 minutes or 45 minutes for discussion. So the attendees will not be able to use the chat box uh, during our, this webinar. Uh, you can write your questions to the Q&A session. You can write it whenever you like. I will, uh, I will be reading them and I will be in a way trying to moderate the Q&A session. So it's, it's an exciting meeting. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to hear from uh, Professor Orhan Ghazi and Dr. Akshay. Um, we'll start with Professor Orhan Ghazi. The floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction and actually like uh, having me here. Uh, let me just quickly uh, begin uh, with sharing my slides here. And I was asked to uh, comment on the uh, financialization process in the US. Uh, so this, what I'm gonna sort of talk about now is I've written extensively on the, uh, on various aspects of financialization in the US economy. And this is not a presentation of a completed research paper, but rather some uh, working notes towards some uh, further research. And what I would like to uh, look at basically is uh, the role of, uh, make some comments about the role of the uh, Fed uh, in this process. And uh, when we think about financialization, basically uh, two broad approaches have been established in the literature, right? Uh, the first one is the mainstream approach, which basically sees uh, deepening financial markets as uh, functional in increasing the efficiency of the allocation of uh, both funds in the economy, but also at the same time, uh, a better allocation of the risks. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, this is mostly post-Keynesian and Marxian economists working on financialization posit uh, the risks of increased fragility and systemic risk due to uh, financialization process. Now there's two versions of this, but uh, the most sort of common one is the Minskyan uh, approach, which stresses the uh, cycles, speculative cycles that follow each other in the economy. And then there's this uh, super cycles approach that's mostly developed by uh, Pali and Duran in which uh, a secular financialization trend is seen as more or less a corrective to the tendencies of secular stagnation uh, within the economy. Now, just to sort of like uh, throw a couple of quotes at you, uh, this uh, approach uh, generally sees financialization as an extension or a result of the uh, accelerated deregulation uh, plus financial innovation that happened after the 1980s and especially in the 1990s. Now, what this has led to is uh, a secular sort of expansion of the financial markets with respect to the non-financial side of the economy uh, together with new financial products and increased leverage in the overall system. Now, this, according to this argument, essentially contributes to the uh, systemic crises that we keep seeing uh, in the post-1980 uh, era. Now, the simple cycle of instability or the simple sort of like Minskyan uh, cycle of instability looks something like this, in which uh, what you have is when you start from a stable uh, economy, uh, over time, as the expansion goes on, what you have is the, uh, this is sort of like the well-known Minskyan stages, in which the agents in the economy pass through sort of like robust financial uh, states to uh, speculative and Ponzi uh, states, which eventually result with a financial crisis and a debt deflation that basically takes you uh, back to the beginning of the uh, stable conditions in sort of like different ways every time. But essentially you have these cycles where you've got the stable conditions creating sort of uh, this speculative wave ending in a crisis and a debt deflation and then going back to the uh, 
stable conditions again. Now, a sort of like super cycle that is imposed by uh, Talia and Duran on this is what you have rather uh, in the post 1980 era is uh, some sort of a super cycle in which every time that there is this sort of like a crisis point, you have the public intervention either uh, by the governments or uh, and or uh, by the central banks, which makes sure that uh, this cycle keeps continuing. So what you have basically is a super cycle in which you have uh, every now and then a decline in the uh, value of the securities and so on, but then eventually sort of like they keep, so this is sort of like a more of a, a secular expansion supported by uh, the public interventions, which then in a way makes it, uh, makes the whole process look something like a, a, like this shape in the sense that uh, you keep having small crises which are managed by the government and the central bank, which actually teaches them uh, how to manage these uh, crises in time, which then leads to more or less rapid recoveries, optimism rebuilt, and maybe more deregulation on the way, more sort of like financial innovation and increased complexity of the financial system. And as you go through these cycles, the systemic risk is increasing. And then you may have, as we've seen in the uh, 2008 uh, global financial crisis, a structural crisis that sort of like brings the system, the whole system uh, to the brink of a collapse. Now, various aspects of this has been uh, examined in the literature, but uh, when you look at uh, the that side of this uh, whole uh, financialization process, what you see basically is uh, in this whole financial expansion, net new investment financing, uh, investment in actual productive uh, assets is a very, very small part of the whole financial system. Most of the financial system essentially is, we're talking about the US here, but it applies to, a couple, you know, to many other places as well, is the rollover of the existing positions. In uh, Toporowski's words, in the era of finance, finance mostly finances finance. So it's turned into sort of like, uh, if you add Hudson to this, uh, in where he argues that debts that can't be paid won't be, now you have a more complicated system, which is basically uh, today, basically built to continue refinancing of the existing debts. Now this leads to a couple of things, uh, starting with the increase in the corporate debt, uh, a series of leveraged buyouts and continuous stock buybacks by the non corporations, plus a whole uh, bunch of financial engineering and you have at the end of the day, uh, what we can call zombie firms, a very large set of zombie firms, especially in the US economy, but also in Europe as well, which are not able to uh, meet any of their sort of like, their, which are not able to make their debt payments at all, which are 100% reliant on simply just rolling over their uh, debts or else they'll just go out of uh, business. Now, in this whole process of financialization, usually uh, two roles have been sort of like uh, two roles of the Fed uh, have been talked about. One was sort of this benign neglect of the asset bubbles in which the argument goes something like this, where uh, the Fed sees the bubbles, but uh, simply ignores the bubbles, don't do anything about them until they uh, actually pop. Uh, and then the second one was the Fed sort of like uh, complicity in the whole uh, deregulation process, which according to a lot of arguments are basically uh, because of the dominance of the uh, pro-finance ideas and interests at the Fed. Now to this, one uh, can add, and this has been sort of like pretty clear both uh, in 2007, 2008 and uh, but at the end of uh, 2019 and this year, that the Fed also provides what we can call safety nets for the uh, speculation. And this has been sort of like 
quite obvious, but on top of this, you know, in, on top of these uh, three roles, the Fed also is very important uh, in uh, re-regulation of the financial system in a deliberate way in which it actually has been uh, making markets that, uh, I'll talk about that in a, in a second, making markets that actually now constitute the whole basis of the financial structure uh, in the US. Now the safety nets, uh, the third one of these, these roles is usually known as, uh, starting in the 1990s, this has been known as the Greenspan put in which uh, people in the markets, in the financial markets have seen and learned that uh, the Fed essentially fears uh, a fall, a significant fall in the asset prices and especially the uh, sort of like the argument is that uh, it fears the political and economic consequences of the, uh, of the fall in the asset prices. And this will be important towards the end of the presentation. And we've seen this not only uh, in the recent uh, COVID-19 uh, shock, but even before that, uh, around September uh, 2019, when there was a market squeeze, the Fed had to uh, instantly like step in and provide that safety net for a whole uh, range of financial assets as well, which essentially the safety net over time uh, turned the Fed from <clears throat> what its usual sort of like function of lender of last resort to what we can call the uh, first buyer of fictitious capital. So that's sort of like that. The market making part is uh, uh, very important as well in the sense that, you know, it traditionally the Fed always makes the markets in the sense that uh, it's Feds and in the US case, FDIC's joint responsibility to ensure that all credit, uh, all bank credit created by each bank is treated equal. Now, uh, part of this is done by the uh, FDIC by giving the same uh, deposit insurance to all banks. And part of that is uh, done by the Fed by giving access to the Fed facilities to a certain a uh, group of banks, hence ensuring that, you know, there's this banking market that works. But in the post-1990 uh, era, uh, this traditional role, on top of this traditional role, what we also see is that Fed has been quite active in creating and supporting uh, what we call the uh, repurchase agreements, repo markets. And the creation and uh, basically support of these liquid markets uh, has been the one of the policy priorities of the Fed. Uh, reminding Keynes' uh, argument about the liquidity, where he talks about there's no such thing as a liquidity of uh, investment for the community as a whole, where the Fed basically is has tasked itself with providing the liquidity for the community as a whole in this sense. And in this respect, the uh, role of the repo market becomes critical because of the whole disintermediation process and the collateralized lending that uh, has risen in this uh, process. What the repo market does is it does two things. One, uh, it allows the, uh, the increase in the size of the financial markets by increasing uh, both leverage and the uh, risk taking, but also it at the same time, given the secular stagnation uh, tendencies, uh, it allows an expansion of the finance sort of like uh, in contrary to the uh, secular stagnation trends within the economy. Now here, two problems arise. One is uh, the rise of collateralized lending or the increase in the size of the repo market uh, led to a continuous need for uh, safe assets that can actually be used as collateral. And the treasuries basically are the, uh, the first sort of like, and the most used safe assets for this. But uh, the use of the treasuries created another problem, which is as the demand for treasuries went up, uh, the returns on the treasuries has gone down significantly, uh, creating problems for a lot of financial institutions, especially pension funds, who depended on uh, these assets to provide returns, which also sort of like led them to uh, increase speculation. In fact, one way to 
look at the 2008 crisis and the period that preceded it is uh, when the US federal government started uh, balancing its budget during the Clinton era, the amount of treasuries available to be used for repos were sort of like uh, going down, which led to increased use of uh, mortgage-backed securities uh, in this process, sort of like as collateral. Now, uh, there's a bunch of uh, examples from, uh, I'll come back to that, but if you read uh, the publications that are coming out of the uh, Bank of International Settlements or the uh, European Central Bank or the Fed, since I don't have uh, too much time, I'm not gonna like read all of them one by one, but they all emphasize uh, the importance of uh, this market in providing the stability of the whole financial edifice that's built up on that. Now, if you sort of quickly look at uh, the average sort of daily repo market uh, in the US, what you see is uh, with the counterparties, the volume sort of reaches around $4 trillion uh, uh, in 2019, $4.5 trillion in 2019. And most of this repo market is based on, as I said, the uh, US treasuries and then uh, the second part is the MBCs, the mortgage-backed securities. Now, <clears throat> uh, two things uh, before I sort of like conclude these observations. One is this is sort of like uh, where you see uh, the intervention by the Fed in the 2008 cri uh, crisis. And then this is sort of like the September uh, problem. And then after that comes the coronavirus thing. So the Fed essentially has to uh, now the system is set up in such a way that the Fed essentially has to uh, keep providing this liquidity or else the whole edifice, not just the single market, uh, is going to collapse. Now, why does the Fed uh, have to do that? Now, this is the other thing, sort of like the result of the Fed interventions as well. The blue line is the total financial assets held by the top 1% in the U.S. economy and the red one is the top 10%. So you can see, you know, this is sort of like uh, beginning of the 2000s, this is the 2008 crisis and this. So the gap is like rapidly opening and then uh, essentially this whole financialization process is leading to an increase in the wealth uh, distribution here. The green line is the, uh, the upper 50%, but these financial assets are mainly their sort of pension fund uh, benefits that they're, uh, they've been saving. So why is this important? Now, this is important because uh, this gives us an idea about the complex structures and how they work, but also uh, looking at this and looking at some of the literature that uh, examines this, we also see that some of these financial markets, especially the repo market, is made in this process. It's not simply an endogenous sort of like result of uh, this process. And it also shows us that the financialization process in the US is very much dependent on uh, active and continuous Fed as well as treasury intervention. And this also in a way shows the limits of the financialization. Finally, before I uh, leave the floor to uh, Umit, uh, kind of like a segue to that, this also shows that uh, in the US, I mean, if you look at the Europe, you pretty much see the same thing. Uh, the, the monetary expansions will not simply spill over to uh, capital flows to emerging markets as we've seen this year, uh, despite like huge Fed uh, expansion, capital outflows has continued from the uh, emerging markets uh, because most of the time, the uh, liquidity and liquidity preferences is the utmost sort of like important thing for these uh, financial agents uh, as opposed to yields or interest rates. I'm a little bit over my time, so I'll just stop now. And then if there's comments and questions, maybe we can just uh, uh, continue. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, it was, it was just a couple of minutes over time, but I didn't want to interrupt uh, as it was a very nice and very clear uh, presentation about the impact of the Fed's interventions during these, let's say, crisis and financial turbulence periods. 
Um, so I, I love the I love the Toporovsky code. Uh, finance mostly finance is finance, and uh, I, I mean I'm I'm really um, excited by the uh, let's say heterodox observations about the emergence of uh, so-called super cycles, and and each time Fed intervenes to provide liquidity for not just providing just uh, for one market but for all the let's say the edifice. Um, it has a dramatic impact on the policy space of the emerging markets. And that leads us to Dumit's presentation uh, about the policy space in the emerging markets and particularly uh, in Turkey and Poland. Uh, Dumit, the floor is yours. Okay, I will just... Um, share my presentation screen. Can you see it now? Yes, Sumit. Okay. Um, just a second, please. All right, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and sharing my ideas with you. Um, today, I will engage in the policy-based debate from critical po political economy perspective. And um, it is also an ongoing work. So I would be very happy to hear your comments, inputs, if you have any. And in this in this uh, work, I will the, the the main puzzle that I'm um, trying to solve is the following. So, after uh, Poland did not experience, for example, a recession uh, during the global financial crisis, and um, Turkey Turkey's 2018 and 19 crisis did not end up with implementing an IMF program, and also. Uh, uh, Indian and Chinese economies continue to grow, grow quite strongly in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. So these are uh, some unusual uh, developments. And I argue that um, the, these, are can, these um, divergences can be uh, seen as symptoms of widening policy space of uh, semi-peripheral countries. And I will also try to connect this argument with the uh, global hegemonic crisis, or in other words, uh, global interregnum period. So uh, I will center my uh, arguments with the, these two following questions. Why and uh, how uh, semi-peripheral countries were able to avoid uh, implementing a 1990s style austerity or even develop a divergent variety of capitalism in, in Chinese case. And um, what is the relation uh, between financialization and the increasing policy space of the periphery? This is a, something uh, uh, that is um, uh, not usual in the uh, critical political economy perspective, but I will uh, try to uh, establish this argument. Okay, um, so uh, let me start with the uh, uh, neoliberal era and the, the framework uh, uh, in this process uh, for the peripheral countries. Um, this uh, quotation, uh, quote is actually uh, summarizes very well this, the, the process, the international asymmetry related to currency hierarchy amplified it by the uh, financial globalization imposes major cons constraints on the uh, uh, adoption of the Keynesian policies or other policy, uh, any policies other than uh, the mainstream ones. And this defines the uh, Washington consensus framework. And in this framework, the main, uh, the main uh, argument is globalization or financial globalization uh, basically limits the policy space of the nation states. And uh, this can be happened 
through external constraints, uh, through international financial or uh, financial institutions, conditionalities uh, would be uh, two, uh, some tools for this, or uh, there may be internal uh, constraints like central bank independence or inflation targeting uh, framework. Um, by this way, um, uh, by this institutional design, monetary policy uh, is located outside of the political sphere, then uh, political, uh, the political parties or governments cannot intervene or use po uh, monetary policy for any uh, purposes. And if they use it, uh, there will be a punishment and pun punishment will be the capital flight and then uh, national governments will be disciplined by the uh, market forces. And actually this defines the uh, narrowing down of the policy spa space uh, any ability to pursue autonomous industrial or trade policy is limited in this framework. So this was a kind of conventional argument of the critical international political economy literature. And um, uh, however, I think that there are uh, some changes in the recent period uh, exactly because of the uh, financialization process. I will try to explain this uh, right now. So if we compare the cr two crises, the recent two crises, large crises uh, of the capitalism, one, in, uh, the one that was in, in 1970s and the, 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 the other one is a recent uh, 2008 crisis. So uh, policy response to the crisis of 70s was, was increasing interest rates because the, the, there was a very high rate of inflation in the US. And the result of this uh, policy response in the core countries uh, for the periphery is that a series of debt crises, Latin America in Turkey and other, uh, other parts of the world. And actually it, ch it changed the uh, accumulation regime from import substitution to export led industrialization in the periphery. And it, it introduced the um, neoliberal policies uh, uh, for the periphery. On the other hand, when we look at the recent uh, period, the Great Recession, uh, because of the financial collapses, as Özgür explained, uh, uh, as Özgür explained, the re policy response was a declining interest rate uh, this time uh, towards the zero bond rate and. Uh, in addition to uh, declining interest rate uh, rates, uh, quantitative easing policies were introduced. So the result was therefore uh, very different from the 70s. Uh, there was a huge uh, capital uh, flows towards peripheral countries between 2010 and 13. Um, so I think this is, an interesting point uh, to discuss. And um, maybe I would like to, uh, maybe uh, uh, I would like to introduce another concept and it would be uh, 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 complete the picture more. As Özgür uh, already mentioned about the financial cycles, I will also use it um, but generally, the, the, the global financial cycles uh, negatively uh, correlate with economic growth in the core countries. So I will just uh, summarize uh, uh, alternative scenarios regarding the peripheral countries. So on the one hand, let's uh, uh, think that uh, there is a very high growth, uh, growth rate in the US economy. And it, it's just uh, generally uh, cu coupled with the high, uh, increasing tendencies of the in inflation. And then the policy response was uh, increasing infl uh, interest rate. And this triggered uh, the, the contraction uh, cycle uh, of the uh, contraction phase in the uh, global financial cycle because of the tightening uh, of the international liqu liquidity. And this uh, resulted in uh, capital outflows from uh, peripheral countries, uh, which may resulted in, 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 in currency crisis 
and recessions. Therefore, um, a balance for, uh, after a balance of payment adjustment, a new uh, growth cycle may, may start. So this was um, uh, one scenario and it happened at the beginning of 2000s actually. And on the other hand, yes, another scenario, um, uh, when there is a stagnation or recession in the core, actually policy response of the Fed uh, was increasing, uh, decreasing interest rates and quantitative initiating quantitative easings and expansion of the uh, financial, uh, uh, which, which triggered expansion phase of the financial cycle. And it's resulted in capital inflows to periphery. And um, this, uh, all, there are also two op options here. Um, now I will uh, explain the first one. And as you can see, the appreciation of national currency is a natural uh, re result of this capital inflows which uh, um, and the overvalued uh, national currency generally undermines the, the, the industrial structure of the country, which resulted in uh, premature deindustrialization. And result is again, current account, increasing current account deficit and uh, current uh, foreign exchange crisis generally. But there may be another options. So I'm mostly interested in the last part. So uh, this uh, abundance of liquidity or, and almost zero interest rates actually may uh, open po policy space for, for policymakers in different contexts. So it, it's just maybe at the beginning, we can say that it's just potential policy space and it may uh, actualize um, um, through um, the country specific domestic uh, developments. For example, the, the, the relationship between the, the state capital and social movements or uh, institutions or historical uh, path dependent uh, developments. So that, uh, there are two cases here. Uh, first uh, is Bolivia. Uh, actually the, the, in Bolivian case, we See, we saw that this potential policy space actually uh, became uh, an actual policy space when uh, more or less government uh, 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 nationalized the financial system uh, 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 recently, or I mean in 2013, around 2013. So uh, it was a clear uh, uh, divergence from the orthodox Washington consensus policies. And it was kind of a left attempt to uh, overcome this, uh, this uh, neoliberal framework. On the other hand, we have another example, a Poland case. And it was a, a, a attempt of right-wing conservative uh, governments. They also initiated a, a nationalization of banking system, but they did not uh, 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 nationalize, but they call it polonize, uh, make uh, foreign capital uh, Polish capital. So uh, they want to increase uh, uh, Polish ownership in banking sector, uh, insurance sector, and other uh, important crucial uh, strategic sectors in the economy. So there was a clear uh, turning point for Poland after global financial crisis, but after 2015, when this new uh, law and justice government came into the power, they actively pursuing they were actively pursuing this policy, and this um, this framework is called sometimes as a conservative developmental state. But what they uh, are actually doing is uh, a, a creating a national capitalism uh, as a response uh, for using this policy space. Um, so I will just have two slides. Uh, I'm trying, uh, then I will uh, wrap up. So uh, I would like to uh, put this developments maybe in, in a historical context and maybe a theoretical context. First, um, if you think about the important crisis, uh, large crisis the, 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 the cap of capitalism in the last century, 
So uh, before and after the crisis, there, there were shifts in the um, main policy making process uh, or framework, both in core and the peripheral countries. So after the Great Depression, there was a clear shift from uh, a clear shift to Keynesianism in the core countries uh, and uh, introduction of the import substitution uh, industrialization was the key uh, policy, uh, became a key policy framework for the periphery. And the crisis of 70s, after the crisis of 70s, again, now uh, uh, there's a shift, there was a shift towards neoliberalism in the core and uh, export-led develop, export -led models uh, develop uh, in the periphery. And when we think about the, the, the latest crisis, the, 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 the 2008 crisis, actually main policy response was more of the same, more of the neoliberalism. But this strategy basically didn't work. And um, after 10 years, uh, there, the, the, so before the Corona uh, crisis hit, actually economies were uh, were slowing down uh, or almost uh, in all con core countries. Therefore, uh, I call I prefer to call it a crisis of the crisis management, and it actually uh, gives um, an uh, or uh, uh, provide a space for peripheral countries to explore more. And uh, so the main policy response, I guess, in the post 2008 uh, period was a quest for uh, new uh, development models or search for new alternatives. It, it can be uh, uh, coming either from uh, left wing or right wing uh, responses. And finally, I uh, think that we can put all these uh, policy space debate in the uh, context of global interregnum, which can be defined as the decline of the old hegemonic power in the absence of new hegemonic state. So uh, here, uh, for example, in, uh, increasing, uh, there is an increasing instability in, uh, in the international money and finance system uncertainty over distribution of the costs uh, of globalization or internationalization of capital among countries uh, and social classes and the relative decline of the US supremacy and inability of the rival forces to take the hegemonic state position over. So uh, these uh, developments also resulted in a change in the international uh, uh, policy regime towards a, um, establishment of a more a more loose international regimes. Okay, these were the uh, main points that I wanted to share with you, and I will I'm, I will stop here. Thank you, Amit. Uh, actually, I know that you have been writing on the global interregnum era and the and the policy space in the emerging markets for quite some time. But it was really, it was really nice to, in a way, listen to your presentation, especially after after the first one. Um, so I hope that we'll be able to discuss about the these three different scenarios, and mm. the um, let's say the recent developments in in not only Turkey but also Poland and elsewhere as well. So uh, for the second round. Um, if you prefer, of course, you can use some of the, that time to expand your discussion and add some uh, further notes to your presentation. But uh, I also would like to, of course, respond and reflect on the, the other uh, scholar's presentation. So we can start with Özgür. Sure. I think uh, this, I mean, at least in my mind, uh, these two uh, presentations sort of like perfectly match in the sense that uh, Umit's uh, central question uh, in a way is, uh, do the uh, peripheral economies actually have uh, new and improved policy space? And if yes, where is this coming from? And like, how is this happening? And Essentially, 
what you see for uh, a bunch of these economies is that they've been dependent on uh, cycles of capital inflows and outflows. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the center itself has been dependent on uh, continuous interventions to provide liquidity in the financial markets. So uh, in a way, now it's not, at least for the US and European markets, in a way it's not uh, the interest rates that matter anymore, but it's the rollover of the existing positions that matter, which requires, and we've seen it like for a long time since uh, 2008, uh, for more than a decade, continuous sort of like interventions by the Fed and the ECB that expanded the global liquidity, that had to expand the global liquidity. So maybe in a way, uh, this will just keep going on, uh, but also we could just say that the, uh, uh, one could also make the argument that the uh, fragilities of the developing emerging economies have not been tested yet. We haven't seen like uh, uh, that test yet. So it's, it's an interesting, so I guess the basic issue here maybe, uh, which is one of the things that Remit is doing is the, uh, the, the importance of these kind of like cross country comparative studies to figure out like uh, what actually is going on depending on uh, the international financial position of these economies, as well as the corresponding sort of like uh, uh, policy space. Uh, just the last thing I would say, I guess, uh, on that about the market punishment that has been happening and that's not uh, happened much and created policy space. Now, uh, if you look at the Turkish economy today, the markets have been punishing quite severely, uh, at least in the last uh, couple of days. Uh, so it's not, so the question is like, does the Turkish government now have more policy space really? Or they just like, you know, being punished and they don't care about it. That's a, that takes us to a different sort of like place, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. So um, actually that was like the first question that I was going to ask to you. Uh, but I mean, let me, me. yeah, let me reformulate my question while listening to it. So you can, you can go on. So it was very unfortunate uh, date for me to present this argument <laughs> when Turkish market is crashing. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, I agree with Özgür uh, and uh, that there is a good match bet between two presentations and uh, the, the centrality of the Fed and uh, the secular expansion of the uh, financialization process is the key, uh, uh, key motivation of my uh, argument about the increasing policy space. Um, however, as Özgür also said that this may not go into the uh, other market, peripheral countries without any uh, problems. So generally in the literature, um, push factors are uh, more important than pull factors. So uh, push factor, so it, irrespective of the con uh, co internal conditions of the countries uh, or receiving countries, if there is a crisis in the core countries and if there is an abundance of liquidity, this money will go uh, somewhere uh, offer uh, which offers more revenue or more more uh, income uh, so uh, I think the situation in Turkey is interesting because for example 2018 and 19 crisis so if um, if if the go if the global financial uh, cycle um, didn't change, I, I think Turkish government uh, had to go to IMF uh, and make made a new uh, standby agreement with the IMF. But as you as you said, in 2019, uh, Fed already changed its positions, started to. Uh, decline interest rates and this actually opened a, a, a window for Turkish Central Bank to increase its uh, rates 
about 13, uh, 20, sorry, sorry, uh, 12 points in one year, in 12 months. And it, uh, and it recovered the, the, from the, the deadliest part, let's say, uh, of the crisis. However, this COVID pro uh, the COVID uh, uh, process is totally different, I guess. Uh, of course, um, uh, and it's Turkish, Turkish uh, markets are affecting most, I guess. Uh, but what I'm trying to argue is uh, it is not related uh, with the uh, uh, recipient countries. Actually, it is related with the core countries and because of the, uh, the changing nature of the crisis, now the policy response of the core countries will continue to be monetary expansion. And it will somehow uh, provide a new policy options for both left-wing governments and the right-wing governments. This, is, this was my point. Thank you, Amit. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, we're moving on to Q&A part of our webinar. Um, I will be uh, I will be reading your questions. If they are too long, I will be actually summarizing them. Uh, so you can write your uh, questions into the Q&A box, um, and I will try to cover all of them. Uh, let's start with the first two. Um, um, so, Tansel Güçlü asks about the, the role of Fed. Um, so, let me summarize the, the question. So, he is actually uh, asking about the role of Fed, whether we should interpret this role as an active maker of financialization or rather a kind of accompanying all these speculative processes and asset bubbles in a rather passive manner. So how can we formulate the role of Fed and its interventions as endogenous to capitalist economic structure? So he's mainly asking about, I mean, he's wanting some more clarification of, about the endogeneity um, of Fed. And uh, Pnar Bedranoğlu's question may also be related to this one. Uh, she is mainly asking about the economic as well as political contradictions of Fed's secular encouragement of financialization, uh, and ac actually she is asking about uh, the. I mean, she is uh, asking about the links of Fed's crisis management in terms of the U.S. the hegemonic position of the United States. Uh, so let's start with these first two. Then I will keep on reading the questions and I have I have a few questions as well I want to ask you uh, well thank you uh, for the questions I think uh, the more I work on this and the more I read uh, both uh, the literature on this uh, but also the actual sort of like uh, minutes and notes from the Fed itself it becomes clear that uh, this is not sort of like a, uh, in no sense, this is a one-way street in the sense that the Fed is a, both making the markets uh, and also at the same time, you know, when they run into problems, uh, rushing to solve those, uh, those problems. This is not to say that the Fed is exogenously like creating this uh, financialization bubble, but it's one of the uh, uh, very active, uh, actors in this in this process and there's different ways uh, of looking at this the most sort of like uh, famous one in the literature i guess is uh, kripner's approach in which uh, in her book where she describes all the actions of the fed and the treasury which were not necessarily designed to create these outcomes they were interventions to certain bottlenecks in the process but uh, at the end each intervention leads to the creation of sort of like something else that's not necessarily, you know, it's not like a process that's, uh, it's not a conspiracy theory in the sense, in that sense where Fed is like dominating the, uh, but uh, in the process, the whole financial edifice, what we call financialization processes or 
uh, these uh, deep financial markets, whatever you want to call them, uh, become essentially uh, very much dependent on the active management and interventions uh, of the Fed as well as the Treasury in this uh, in the U.S. example. Uh, for example, uh, just to give you an example, uh, in the 2000s when the U.S. government started paying off its debt under Clinton and when the, the amount of Treasuries were like the available Treasuries to be used as collateral were going down, the U.S. Treasury was actively debating and considering, you know, different ways of dealing with this problem, like maybe sort of like creating some sort of treasuries, even though the US government did not uh, need to borrow uh, at this time. So this sort of like, just to contribute to the liquidity, uh, liquidity making in the market. Now, uh, this sort of like goes to Pinar's uh, question in the sense that the whole, uh, series of uh, interventions are contradictory in the sense that uh, each intervention made by the Fed and the Treasury require even larger interventions uh, down the road. That's why I showed that uh, Fed balance sheet graph in which you know, uh, 2008 is the worst financial crisis we've ever seen since 1929. And at the time that intervention that the Fed made was unbelievably large, right? Now, if you compare it with the intervention made in 2020, that's a very small intervention made in 2008. So, you know, requiring you to make a even larger sort of like, uh, of course, the Corona, the COVID-19 shock was like uh, a different type, but still uh, the, the, the size uh, shows it. But also the other side, which I haven't talked about much, but uh, in terms of the hegemony of the uh, of the U.S. and its link to this, there's two issues. One, uh, both crises, both 2008 and 2020, uh, showed that there's no decline in the role of the U.S. dollar in the international system at least yet, right? Because that, you know, as soon as the crisis hit, everybody runs uh, to the dollar. So, but you know, also the Fed. Uh, had to extend these swap lines and stuff like that. So, uh, but uh, the other and more important part is uh, even if the US's hegemony was uh, declining, their ideas are becoming more and more dominant in the sense that uh, if you look at the European financial markets, there's deliberate reorganization of the uh, European repo markets uh, after the US model. Right. This is sort of similar to uh, the central bank independence and inflation targeting policies adopted following the U.S. model in most of the world uh, after that. So it's still the, 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 the U.S. financial markets are the role model for uh, the European uh, financial markets as well. And this active sort of like even more active intervention in the European uh, financial markets uh, to make the uh, repo markets especially more like the, the, the US. So in that sense, that ideological hegemony, at least uh, in terms of the economic policy, uh, seems to be even uh, getting stronger. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have two questions for Umit, and I would like to add mine on top of these, they, because they are all related. Uh, Jemina Pehlivan is asking about the possibility of uh, replacing dollar in the global system. Uh, what do you think about the dollar-based global financial system regarding the global interregnum? And um, actually, Pnar Bedranoğlu's question is also related to this point. Uh, as you know, during the COVID-19 shock, um, the Fed um, extended the swap operations with a couple of uh, emerging markets. So it actually provided a kind of a briefing space for these countries during the uh, pandemic initiated slump or collapse. And um, how do you evaluate these swap agreements in terms of US government's involvement in the southern countries? Actually, my question is also related to this point. During these, uh, let's say, slumps or financial turbulences, we always see the, uh, in a way, flight to safety. And it seems that despite the, let's say, longer periods of 
so-called capital inflows, uh, extending the policy space for countries such as Poland and Turkey. What we see is a dramatic decline of this same policy space within just a few months or weeks in some cases. And the, for example, the outflow of COVID-19, outflow during the COVID-19 from these emerging markets surpassed the outflow in the 2008 crisis. So how would you, in a way, integrate this, these phenomena into your perspective on, on, the, on the widening policy space argument? Okay. Uh, as for the swap lines, um, I guess when we look at the, uh, the official uh, announcement of the Fed, they said that, okay, we are uh, opening the swap lines to the countries uh, which we have a very large commercial and financial uh, relations. So this is, this is their official uh, uh, announcement, but of course, uh, geopolitical uh, concerns uh, may play a role in this decision. I don't know that, so it's, but you can speculate about it. Um, as for the dollar hegemony, uh, uh, I don't see that uh, dollar hegemony is declining soon, near soon. And, um, and, and other currencies are replacing the dollar, dollar's position. That's the definition of the interregnum, by the way. So uh, US is definitely ha has a superior role in militarily and financially, but uh, in terms of production and uh, size of the economy and contribution to the global growth, uh, the other, other uh, actors are uh, playing part now. So this is actually definition of the uh, interregnum and it will create a constant tensions among, uh, among countries. And um, as for the, your, your question, yeah, it's, uh, it's very contradic uh, uh, contradictory. And uh, I'm not sure if we can uh, um, define it as a constant policy space. Because uh, uh, I mentioned Bolivia, but uh, afterwards of the nationalization of this uh, banking system, uh, there was a kind of coup uh, and more or less government uh, uh, collapsed uh, a couple of years ago. And, and afterwards, uh, now they re-elected. So it's a constant, uh, I guess, uh, um, struggle between um, social classes and um, and it will define the policy uh, uh, define the make potential policy space actual if there is any but if there is no policy space as we have seen the during this uh, capital outflows and so there is no discussion for sure but I sh uh, but I think that um, the this cannot be happening uh, for for good. Uh, this COVID process is COVID nineteen shock is very specific, and uh, it proves the superiority of U.S. dollar, of course. But and uh, but afterwards, when two thousand twenty one and twenty two, when the economies are uh, opening again. Uh, I'm sure there will be uh, capital uh, flows to uh, developing countries again. So, it, otherwise, it, it, it's impossible to sustain global uh, financial system. It has to be uh, that way. Uh, we have two more questions, uh, but I'll change the order of them. Um, so uh, the last one uh, is, is to Professor Orhan Ghazi and mainly about the role of China in the global markets. Uh, Jamal Balaman is asking whether uh, China aims to establish a new hegemony and become, try, trying to become a, a kind of a rival to the USA or um, the countries becoming more integrated to the existing global financial system or international economic system. And maybe 
you can also relate this to the expectations for post COVID era. Um, can we, can we uh, foresee a kind of a, let's say a deflationary slump in some countries, including the United States because of the lower interest rates, because of the expectations for the medium term. Um, I'm not of course suggesting that they will in a way follow the footsteps of Japan, uh, but um, maybe we can, um, we can also uh, in a way talk a little bit about the post COVID-19 uh, era. Okay, well, uh, let me start with the uh, China question. I don't know much about China, obviously, but uh, one thing that I know, and uh, I've actually seen uh, this being debated uh, in among the Chinese uh, economists and policymakers as well, uh, and this goes back to my earlier hegemony comment, is that there's two broadly in terms of the financial markets to me from outside it looks like there are two uh groups that are debating this one group is very much uh in favor of uh, u.s style uh, financial markets being established in uh, china as well uh, opening up of the chinese financial markets and these are mostly uh, and not surprisingly as far as i can sort of like follow uh, U.S. trained economists and uh, policymakers that uh, Chinese students that went to the U.S. to do their PhDs or whatever, and then there's this more sort of, uh, I guess, uh, in Chinese terms, more orthodox group that is uh, trying to resist the U.S. style financial markets. So the you can see the hegemony of U.S. type financialization uh, trying to sort of like make inroads into the. Uh, Chinese economy as well. And the argument that these uh, people who actually support US style financial markets is similar to the one that's posed in the question in the sense that uh, they think that this would actually uh, allow China to integrate into the uh, international uh, financial system and the world economy in a more sort of like smooth way. Uh, and this view seems to be sort of like gaining uh, more and more power within the communist party itself as far as i can i can i can follow so that would be all i mean i'm as i said i don't know much about the uh the actual sort of like policies uh, implemented but this is just my impression from following some of the debates that uh that's going on uh, among the chinese uh, economists and policy makers i guess uh in relation to Ali Rizal's uh, question of this sort of like, uh, what's going to happen in the future? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's usually difficult to predict what's going to happen in the future. Uh, but uh, if sort of like my analysis uh, in terms of the uh, liquidity versus interest rates, uh, the role of liquidity versus interest rates has some validity, uh, then it basically tells us that it doesn't matter what the interest rates are essentially for uh, the US economy right now in the sense that uh, nobody is like uh, using, well, very few people, very few firms are using uh, the credits to finance new investment. A huge chunk of it is going basically to refinancing the existing positions and uh, trying to sort of rebalance portfolios and stuff like that. So in that sense, liquidity is more important so that they can actually do this than the interest rates because say you have these huge uh, leveraged positions and the interest rate is not 0% but 2%, doesn't matter as long as you can actually sort of like uh, continue with that position, you would be, it would be worse for you if the interest rate was, was, was zero, but you didn't have enough liquidity in these markets to refinance those positions. So in that sense, maybe uh, that zero uh, bond has been hit for a long time ago and the interest rates don't uh, quite work. Uh, 
and the Fed's interventions are actually making sort of like uh, staying within the financial circuit more and more lucrative than uh, actual investments in the uh, in the especially given the huge uncertainties going on in terms of like the near uh, term as well as sort of like medium term uh, in the real economy. Uh, that also ties back into uh, the current research that I've been doing that you talked about at the beginning in terms of the market structures in the US increased monopolization and concentration, which is uh, at the same time limiting uh, investment uh, opportunities within the US as well. So, but that's, uh, uh, that's maybe uh, a different day's discussion. Thank you. So um, I'm I'm reading the the question of anonymous attendee to Umit. Um, so basically, uh, he or she is asking about the impact of Turkish government, uh, the policy responses of Turkish government, uh, and particularly the preference to. Um, maintain the zombie firms alive. Uh, so, um, Pai, in a way, try to um, relate this to the, as well to the other cases in, let's say, the emerging markets. Um, how do you evaluate the policy preference of the, uh, of actually, um, I mean, keeping the zombie firms alive? Is it a similar case in, for example, Poland, and can we say during this COVID-19 shock, has this been a kind of a um, response in other emerging countries as well? Um, during the COVID crisis, COVID shock, yes, this is the main policy response. Every government is trying to do it, and Germany is trying to do it, and others as well and Poland as well. Uh, but I think zombie zombie uh, companies are uh, specific to Turkish, and not specific to Turkish case, but uh, it is very related with the political economy of the um, Turkish government. Um, so basically, I think there is a uh, one uh, dividing line between large companies and small ones in Turkey large companies generally have access to international uh, markets and they can hedge uh, their uh, foreign exchange risks. Um, on the other hand, others uh, mostly depending on national markets, national loan markets, and they don't have too much uh, uh, hedging uh, positions. Therefore, government have to uh, cover the the majority uh, of the companies the small ones that's why they uh, uh, initiated uh, the huge uh, state guarantees in 2017 and now they are implementing the same policy as well so um, it, i think that this is happening because these companies um, uh, are also uh, go the governing party's political base. Uh, but the challenge for the, uh, for the government is they have to keep a uh, balance between large companies and small companies. So they have to keep this balance um, in order to, let's say, uh, continue to into the power. Therefore, it's, it's, it's a challenging process. I don't know uh, how they will manage it. Thank you, Emit. Um, so I'm, I'm checking the Q&A box once again. It seems that uh, we have one new question. Uh, and let me also uh, ask this question to both of our speakers. Um, uh, so do you see a kind of a post-COVID scenario, post-COVID-19 scenario in Turkey where private banks may once again become uh, the major actors uh, funding the government as they did in the 1990s? 
you know that for just providing a kind of a background uh, for the other attendees, the public debt ratio, uh, the ratio of public debt to GDP in Turkey skyrocketed uh, in, in the last uh, couple of months. And uh, maybe uh, that's why uh, the attendee is asking about whether we will see a similar mechanism built uh, between the commercial banks and the treasury in Turkey in the coming years. Actually, I couldn't quite understand the question, but the, the, because of the government that will increase, uh, private banks will buy pub, uh, government securities in order to finance it. Is this the question? Yeah, yeah. Mainly a comparison with the 1990s. Uh, I think this is, okay, this is, mm -hmm. this is uh, quite different period and I don't see any parallels with 1990s. I, I don't know if Özgür has other comments. I mean, uh, at some point the uh, government, well, this is kind of like actually similar to uh, the Fed Treasury argument as well, in the sense that if you look at the Turkish government's uh, latest uh, debt issues, they've started like issuing uh, government bonds in, I think in euros, right? Uh, or, and the main in, reason- Yeah, in euros and US dollars. Uh -huh. In euros and US dollars, but in the domestic market. So they slept like foreign borrowing. They've issued this uh, in US dollars and uh, euros, uh, mainly because uh, the banks needed uh, foreign assets, at least like dollar, uh, foreign currency denominated assets. And the government actually was just providing it uh, to them in order for them to be able to like balance their uh, balance sheets. So this is quite different, as Umit says, in that in that in that regard. Where now uh, the banking system is very much different. It's very much integrated with the rest of the world. It's got its own uh, open positions that are actually being sort of like. Uh, helped by the government, but also it's got like a very high degree of integration with the foreign banks or the share of foreign banks in the Turkish economy is also quite high uh, in that sense. And uh, most of the issue right now is not yet uh, government debt in Turkey, but it's the private sector's debt and whether the private sector will be able to uh, roll over this debt. And uh, in fact, since 2018, they've been like paying off. So the rollover ratio is like something, I guess, around uh, 80%, maybe 76%, depending on where you start the, uh, the, the calculation. So uh, so it's exactly like, it's, uh, as you said, it's a completely different uh, situation in that sense. And if it came to that point, I guess, uh, it'd be the Turkish government that would be able to borrow from international markets before uh, the Turkish banks, uh, if it comes to that that point. That's that's how it looks like, at least if you look at the balance sheets right now. Uh, so thank you. We have no more questions uh, from the attendees, and I believe we had a long and a great discussion. Uh, thanks to all of the attendees uh, for uh, staying with us. And uh, so thanks to the scholars, um, it was really exciting. Uh, thanks to Professor Orhan Gadi and Dr. Akshay for the wonderful presentations. Uh, let me remind to the attendees um, of the final meeting in our webinar series. It will be uh, held on November 24th. Um, the webinar is the politics of corruption and the state transformation. So we have we will have uh, Pınar Bedranoğlu, Dr. Bedranoğlu, uh, and Dr. Ceren Ergenç as the speakers. Uh, so hopefully uh, we will meet once again in this uh, in the final meeting of our webinar series. Thank you once again. See you all. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you.